going to be on Open We Switch uh, by Aaron Connell. Yep. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Aaron. This talk is on uh, OVS debug. Um, I, uh, it, it's going to be very kind of terminal oriented and, and a lot of text, so sorry. Uh, I guess read your email if that kind of stuff bores you. Um, so this talk is going to be about debugging, uh, networking with Open vSwitch. Uh, I don't mean like debugging the C code of Open vSwitch, so we're not going to go do anything with GDB. Um, but we are going to do use some kind of fancy uh, OVS commands. Um, we will talk about tracing packets. And yes, that does mean we'll be using TCP dump a little bit. But no, TCP dump is not the only thing you need, uh, or, or rather, is not the only tool you need to reach for when uh, working with OVS. Um, finally, I'm not going to touch uh, net filter, routing table, any of those things. Uh, we'll get to why in, in a bit, but just if, if you you know if you have a problem and you think like oh okay open v switch and net net filter aren't playing well together um, will we will cover it but I'm not going to talk about net filter okay so two types of people I've kind of geared this talk for people who are writing SDN orchestration tools. Um, and people who are supporting, uh, you know, in a, in a kind of a support role. Um, the most common things that come up are packets don't go out, packets go out the wrong port, uh, performance is bad. Those are kind of uh, the, the big ones. And then most recently, when we uh, enabled support for running stuff under SE Linux, um, OBS doesn't start. But we should have solved that. Those are those are real uh, OVS bugs. All right. So how does OVS work? It's two daemons primarily. Uh, we have the OVS DB, which is the configuration database, and the vSwitch D, which does the forwarding decisions and the flow pipeline. Um, there are some important uh, commands that go along with it. OVS VS Cuddle is one of the most common ones. Um, that's how you add ports, uh, add bridges, you know, dump database information from OVSDB. Um, another one that's important for debugging diagnostics is OVS App Cuddle. And that will allow you to actually send commands to specific OVS applications. So you can do OVS app cuddle commands for the DB. You can do OVS app cuddle commands for the vSwitch D. Um, you know, any, any of the daemons that are running will have their own set of commands. And OVS app cuddle is, is how you would access. The OVS DB contains just configuration information. Ports, bridges, interfaces, mirror information, um, that, that kind of stuff. Uh, it, it doesn't contain, um, you know, uh, other, other kind of data, I guess. Uh, it doesn't hold copies of packets. It, it's not involved in the actual forwarding at all. It just says, this is the configuration. Um, you can dump that information by uh, using OVS VS Cuddle Show, OVS VS Cuddle List, etc. Um, sometimes the DB can contain what's called, what some people refer to as stale information. Um, what that means is someone has added some, some port configuration, we'll say, for a port that doesn't exist. Um, the DB does not enforce that you are, uh, that you have a correct configuration. So it's just like a configuration file where you can throw in whatever interfaces you want, the DB will allow you to put anything in it. Um, so, yeah, beware. The vSwitch D is the other side of OVS, the, the forwarding side, and that will pull all the configuration out of the database. Okay? It will make sure that the running state of the system matches what's in the database. And it will clean up any flows that have been installed in any of the data paths periodically. And it will make sure that new flows that are required are inserted. Okay? That's basically all it does. I mean, it, it's 
we'll get to some other kind of minor things it does, but for the most part, it's just making sure things are matching what's in the configuration that's been requested. Okay, there are two important data paths that vSwitchD cares about. NetDev and NetLink. So NetLink is, you know, sometimes what you might call the kernel data path. Um, it's important to note that like OVS runs on Windows as well as Linux and, you know, Mac and all that. So, and FreeBSD and whatever else. And so some operating systems, notably Windows and Linux, they have support for using this NetLink data path. So, um, you know, the, the, uh, the vSwitchD in that case will generally prefer to use the NetLink data path. We'll get to why in a, in a second. Um, but we call that the kernel data path usually. The NetDev data path is all done in user space. That means packets come in into the vSwitchD and the vSwitchD processes them and pushes them out as well. So it's kind of simple what happens in a data path, right? Pack it in, pack it out. Um, there are kind of two paths. There's the fast path in, in kernel, or you know, we'll get to something in net lane, in uh, net dev. And then there's the slow path, which is which is everything that fast path can't do. So when fast path can move a packet, it does. When it can't move a packet, it defaults to the slow path. Okay, that's what we call like kind of an up call, right? I actually like to think of it as a as a down call, but they think of it as as like going up to user space. Um, but the packet, you know, when the packet doesn't match any rules in the kernel uh, flow table, it'll get pushed into user space, and then the user space has to figure out what's going on. Um, there's no net filter processing. So OVS, the OVS data path, does nothing that, that you don't ask it to do, or, or rather only does what you ask it to do. So if you don't ask it to send the packet through something that handles uh, NetFilter, so if you want IP tables processing and you add some IP tables rules selecting on packets that are in your OVS bridge, uh, you'll notice that those rules don't do anything. Um, that's because the packet comes in and is processed by the data path and is and is pushed right out, there's no chance for NetFilter hooks to operate. You would need to like somehow distribute it to the local host, um, push it to some kind of local interface that can be, you know, that, that has those NetFilter hooks, maybe a VEATH device, maybe a TUN device, something like that. Um, otherwise, o OBS isn't gonna call those things and it, and it won't push things out to contract, for instance, without you telling it. So. Really, OVS tries to do the most simple thing possible, pack it in, pack it out, and, and give you the building blocks to build uh, what you want. So this is kind of like, you know, this, this picture kind of just illustrates what I've been talking about. Packet comes in, that packet is matched against the flow key table, okay? If, if there's no key that matches that packet, so meaning, whatever metadata is associated with that packet, um, whatever stuff makes up a flow key. So for instance, IP source dest, um, ETH source dest, uh, you know, ports, uh, what port it came in on, those kind of things. If, if those aren't in the flow key table to match, then it will be sent down to vSwitchD, you know, or, or rather they like to flip the, the picture and say it's sent up to vSwitchD. Uh, and a packet is processed by the vSwitchD and then pushed out. And simultaneously, a flow will get installed into the flow key table to match future packets that come in. Okay, the net dev data path is a little bit different because there's no need for an up call, as it were, right? So, uh, and, and it can do some other things. So it can take advantage of some packet batching if that's, if that's possible. And, um, it, it actually also uses a whole bunch of caches. Uh, and maybe if we have time, we can talk about some issues around the caches. Um, this is kind of a, an illustration of what happens, like a, a batch of packets would come in, would be, would be pulled off of a port, 
they would be run through the what's called the EMC or the exact match cache. There's actually another cache called the SMC, but that we'll just call that part of the EMC. Um, that EMC is very small, so you can see like the cost. I've tried to illustrate it getting a little bit more each time you have to go uh, to the next cache. The EMC is very small, um, but the idea is it's very fast. Um, if the packets don't match in the EMC, they're pushed on to the data path classifier. And if they don't match in the data path classifier, they go through proto processing. <clears throat> in OVS, uh, rather in open flow, everything is like match action. So fields like packet type, um, IP header information, all of that, those are what you can match on. <clears throat> And you can also match on some metadata, what port it came in on, or you know, what, what bridge is being used, um, that, that kind of information. Um, and then the actions are all like what to do with the packet. Jump to other tables, output to ports, push it over to whatever contract implementation, um, you know, modify parts of the packet, drop the packet. Those are, those are all actions. All right, so when do things go wrong? Open vSwitch never takes action unless it's been told to, right? So uh, the Netlink data path is simple, just forwards packets, maybe it'll go out to contract, but, but that's it. NetDev is a bit more complex because it has those caches and it has to be involved in kind of pulling the packets and pushing the packets, but really it's still just forwarding packets. Um, and it's really software-defined networking. And what that means is the most likely when you have a problem with a packet moving, just like when your computer, when you have a problem with a program running, most likely you told OVS to do something that you didn't intend. So you told it to take some action, and it's taking that action, but it's not doing, it's not taking that action. The result is not what you expect. Um, but usually it's not a fault of OVS. You've told it what to do. It's carrying it out. Um, orchestrators probably misconfigure things. We see this a lot. So things like adding ports and then forgetting to delete them because of race conditions internally. Or uh, you know, adding improper flow rules for the system that forward packets like kind of all over and create loops. Um, bad port parameters, so setting things up, setting queues up incorrectly, or uh, you know, setting uh, priorities incorrectly, or, or binding queues to specific CPUs incorrectly. Um, failing to restore flows after OVS restarts. So some of them don't, don't uh, detect that OVS has had a fault, crashed, and come back up, and so then your system has no flows. It's not going to process anymore. Um, and, and failure to observe faults in OVS. So it's important to remember, upstream is always available to help. Everyone on OVS, uh, in the OVS community really does want the, the OVS software suite to, to work. So go to openvswitch.org. Seriously, not joking. Go sign up on the discuss and dev lists. Like right now, uh, people already have their laptops out, so you know, and you can do it on your phone too. It's it's pretty simple, so uh, I'm not kidding. Like, it, it's it's good to do. There's a lot of good information there, um, and people are very responsive. So, for the remaining part of the talk, I'll try to like do some examples. It's always good to have like a real test environment. So. Uh, I like to use network namespaces and VEF devices. VEF devices actually work for both data path types um, pretty well. Uh, they're simple to set up. It's simple to set up network namespaces. Here's like uh, six, eight, ten, maybe like eleven commands or something to to set up like two network namespaces connected through VEF devices so that you can ping from one to the other, you know, back and forth. And by default, this this will work. I mean, like you can you can send packets back and forth. Um, another great environment where you can actually work with a real uh, orchestrator is uh, OpenShift includes this um, Docker and Docker cluster kind of hack script. Um, that's really cool because it, it does set up like Open vSwitch, it adds flows, it allows you to start pods on your, on your local machine and you can play around with it. It's, it's, uh, I actually like that uh, quite a bit. So. All right, 
a lot of times, problems that get reported can be solved by just looking at the logs. Okay, uh, vSwitchD logs a lot. Um, it, it is configurable, but vSwitchD definitely logs uh, any errors, warnings, you know, all that. And if you're using the NetDev data path with DPDK ports, all the DPDK log data is also in the OBS vSwitchD log. And uh, I don't know how many times we've gotten like bugs reported where in the log it actually says, you know, this port is not available for whatever reason. And uh, people like complain to us, oh, uh, we, we don't know what's going on, like why OVS isn't working. You know, that's, that's, the, that's the thing they say. And like uh, in the log, it actually tells you this port failed to add and it tells you why. You know, the, oh, the IOMMU is misconfigured or, or something else. So you can actually see right there, you know, what, it, what went wrong and go fix it. A lot of people ignore this. Uh, it, it could have answered simple why questions. Uh, I mean, really, the logs are quite good. Sure, anytime. So, as someone who's not down with OBS, in the defense of people with good logs, they can be fairly critical for I don't know if this has been, I'm not going to ask one of those more than important questions about how people log, but. Um, has there been, you know, has it, I've been to a walk one conference, same one from the shirt you're wearing. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Now that I'm halfway through my rambling, they'll give me a mic. Um, is there any thought on making that better or making it a little bit, because especially with the different kinds of net devs and, you know, DPDK errors look different than regular using the standard DPIF? Um, yeah, um, so that's a good point. Uh, one thing that's nice, though, with the lo in defense of the logs, what I will say is, anytime there's an error, it actually you can just grep for that ERR or warn string. Uh, I, I know what you're saying. Um, I agree. Sometimes it's, it is difficult to understand the faults. Um, I'll get to that. Uh, well, not in the next slide, but in a, in a couple slides, there there are some stuff I'll talk about. Um, yeah. Check your firmware, check your kernel, you know, but make sure like the version numbers for firmwares, are, or the version number for the firmware are appropriate to the software you're using. Um, we did actually have uh, instances where like NICs were sending up multiple packets, right, duplicate packets, and it was being blamed on OBS, and the, the uh, team hadn't upgraded their firmware in like two or three years, and it, it was mismatched with the driver, and, it, and the driver was actually thinking it was programming something to the NIC, and instead it was telling the NIC to like duplicate the packet and forward it up in the queue. So uh, really it's important to make sure that the configurations are set right. Um, sometimes some offloads do cause problems for certain network uh, scenarios. I know uh, Andy just did a talk and he said, oh, people always just disable offloads and here I am on stage like advocating, yeah, just disable offloads, but um, sometimes they don't make sense. So, um, and, and sometimes you have hardware that does require additional work to get, um, to get the kind of functionality that you want. There may be additional kernel module parameters, additional BIOS setup, additional, um, you know, other things that, that have to be done for that hardware to work optimally um, or even at all. Okay, so a little bit to answer your question uh, or to go back to your logging question. So. A lot of times when a port is misconfigured, uh, it just shows up in OVS VS Cuddle Show, right? So if you do an OVS VS Cuddle Show and there's a port error, it usually just shows up, uh, like right there, you know, it, in this case, these ports are set up correctly, but a lot of times it will say, like if you add a, a port that doesn't exist, it will say that port's not found, you know, right there, you could, you could just see it. So there's no need to grep the logs in that case. Although it will show up in the logs too, so. Um, now, someone might ask, oh, well, you know the port's not there, can't you just write a cleanup script? It's actually a little bit difficult, right? You have to know what kind of port you're dealing with. For instance, vhost user ports won't show up in the, uh, in the kernel 
uh, IP, you know, in the kernel, uh, like if you do a Netlink query to get all the interfaces on the system, you won't see vhost user ports. So you have to know like which ports to whitelist. You won't see DPDK ports. So you might assume that they're that they're non-existent if you do like a simple naive match, and you might remove a working config. So a cleanup script is really difficult. It's it, I like to say it's best for the orchestrator to clean up the ports it adds. You know, like that because the orchestrator is supposed to know. Um, OVS really can't. And then for the net dev data path. Uh, which really only applies to OpenStack deployments. Uh, I don't think OpenShift is using DPDK uh, at all. Um, but DPDK ports do require extra configuration to get optimal uh, performance, or even sometimes to get performance at all. So you need to check your hardware topology. Make sure like your NUMA nodes, uh, the hardware is correctly matched, and the, v and the VMs are correctly spawned on the right NUMA node um, to get optimal performance. Um, are your kernel parameters or, or TuneD parameters set up correctly? Did you use ISIL CPUs? Did you turn off the, the RCU um, processing? Did you do, uh, you know, like, did you allocate enough huge pages? Um, are your VMs, you know, on the right node or even, you know, accessing those huge pages? Is that configuration right? Um, there's a lot of additional stuff on top of Open vSwitch for that to work. Um, and, and finally, you should know when you're debugging this stuff what your network topology is uh, supposed to be. So what was the, it, a lot of projects actually set up their, their network topologies differently. OpenShift wants to configure OVS differently than OpenStack and, and probably different than Rev and probably different than, you know, uh, some other uh, project that's, that's using SDN so, and, and controls Open vSwitch. So I say, like, all bridges are not created equally. Um, a lot of times developers make assumptions about how packets should flow when they do, like, when they add an OVS bridge. But uh, if you read that blog, which I wrote, so it's a plug for me, uh, but if you read that blog, it actually goes over that really the OVS uh, kernel data path, a bridge is kind of a fiction on top of a bunch of flow rules. It's, it's not really, um, it doesn't exist as a, as like a, a thing in, in the way of that packet. So it's, it's not even a bump in the wire or something. Um, OpenShift and OpenStack, you can actually read how they like to set up their uh, network. Uh, at, at these two URLs, um, so th there's there's a lot of good information there. You'll you'll find out about like what VRint, BRX, you know, all those different bridges do, and and for OpenShift, it's radically different. Um, does your system, you know, when you're using OpenStack, when you're using OpenShift, this is true. Does your system use the kernel uh, IP stack, the, the kernel networking stack, in addition to Open vSwitch? For OpenShift, it's true. Um, and they have a ton device, and they forward packets through that to, to provide IP tables hooks. So OVS doesn't directly use the routing table. OVS, I mean, it can, um, and in some cases it will, but, but generally speaking, it, it doesn't. Um, OVS doesn't use NetFilter. It uses, like, contract, and only if you've told it to. So it, it's not really, like, uh, it doesn't, I mean, it's integrated with the kernel, but it doesn't use those parts of the kernel you haven't asked it to use. Question? Or how would you map these rules that you've set up? Is um, there a way for the user? The rules to are view different. That? If you're asking about like topology, I would say use plotnet config, or uh, I think there's actually a, another tool called Skydive, um, and both of those will actually like detect what uh, ports you're using. They'll they'll kind of give you a, a graph like a GNU plot. Um, graph that shows how the interfaces are, are kind of interconnected. It won't show you the flow rules, though. Um, maybe Skydive will. Uh, but, but I will get to how to debug those flow rules okay. in just and a And then the, do the old things like BGP and all that stuff, does that still exist in this world, or is that just a different world since you're not using routing tables? and? So OVS operates at kind of a lower level, right? It's just move packets based on matching these fields from one place to another. So all that routing decision, uh, all that BGP, OSPF, all that, um, that's done at kind of a higher layer. Uh, I, mm. 
Okay, we can follow up. Um, so sometimes when the setup is wrong, you can actually see how it was how it was made wrong by using the OVSDB tool. So if you do this OVSDB tool show log and point it at the at the database, um, it will give you uh, a rundown of the transactions that happened and which process executed those transactions. So it's quite helpful if something got set up incorrectly. Um, you can also grab some stats. Um, this is like for the for the net dev um, data path. So you can see like um, running statistics for how the uh, how the forwarding engines are are working. Um, kernel has other ways, and and uh, you can you can pull some interface you can pull interface statistics when the port is uh, non DPDK port. Like if it's a kernel port, you can pull those interface statistics using your standard you know IP and uh, if config and uh, Eve tool. So sometimes packet goes out of an interface, we have no idea why, right? So we do something like dump flows, right? In this case, it's really simple, right? Oh, okay, there's one flow, it's normal action. Oh, okay, so it's behaving kind of like, you know, a switch. Um, and a lot of times you can just, you know, if, you're, if your flow rules are small, you can just watch like which flow has these, see this end packets, you can see like which end packets are increasing. Um, that works great if you have a static setup, there's no data going through, and you can push the packets. Uh, it doesn't work well on heavily loaded systems. Um, and a lot of times you'll be reading through reams of flows. You can do something crazy like uh, I've done before, which is like you can dump the flows and use diff and like try to compare them, but uh, that's the C and kernel and all that programmer in me coming out. Like that's not really people don't like to do that. Um, and I like to equate it to you know finding the Higgs boson, Higgs boson right? Like it's a whole bunch of stuff is blasted through this, and you're kind of just sifting through all this data to to figure out what's what's going on. And what complicates it or makes it worse is the flows as they look in the kernel data path are completely different than what the open flow rules look like. So, because again, as I said, the kernel data path, for instance, it's just a flow key match, right? It's just, it's just, oh, these specific things match, this is all you have to do. There's no processing. Um, whereas, like, the, in the user space side, it will evaluate these rules. So, it, it's a bit more complicated. But maybe there's a better way. So, we'll take a quick detour, right? What's an SDN system? It's programmable. Uh, it has instructions, a pipeline, you know, it's like kind of a, a processing chip, but it's specific for packets. Um, and that means we do have some cool debugging tools. So the one that I would reach for to, to answer your question about tracing these flows is OF Proto Trace. Um, you give it a description of a packet, or you can give it an actual packet dump, and it will show you how it evaluated those rules. Right, so from the example, I made a change to the flow rules, right, from that demo example I showed. I made a change to the, to the flow rules. And you can see here, an ARP ping works, but an ICMP ping does not. So if I use OF Proto Trace and just say, okay, show me ARP, um, it actually shows that, okay, it matched a rule, ARP, in port one, at that priority, uh, the action is output to two, right? But if we trace ICMP, we see that there were no rules matching. So clearly, in my flow rules somewhere, I, I have accounted for ARP, I might have accounted for TCP, I might have even accounted for UDP or SCTP, but I forgot ICMP. So we can go through and, and debug. How much? Okay. Um, so yeah, as far as getting packet data goes, all right, sometimes that's, that's what people reach to. Um, so you could just reach to TCP dump. TCP dump works great if you have a kernel interface. Uh, it doesn't work at all for vhost user. It doesn't work for DPDK ports. Um, but OVS includes OVS TCP dump, which sets up a mirror, and that works internally for OVS for all kinds of ports, kernel ports, uh, VOS user ports, all of that. Um, and then it has this other cool gadget called OVS TCP undump. So remember I said OF Proto Trace can take packet bytes, 
you can actually pipe TCP dump into TCP undump and you will get those bytes out. And you can then feed those to an OF proto trace. So in conclusion, sorry for concluding so quickly, but um, OVS debug really shouldn't feel daunting. There's a ton of documentation. I know I pushed a, a lot of uh, URLs up there, um, but there's a, there's a ton of stuff on the web to read. OVS documentation is really top notch. You can go to openvswitch.org. Uh, you should already be there from signing up for the mailing list. So you can just click over uh, and, and actually read through some of the docs. Um, OVS is almost always doing exactly what it's asked to do. That's software, sometimes it has bugs, but um, usually uh, what you're seeing is not a bug in OVS, it's a bug in what you've programmed into OVS. Uh, finally, those are some of my email addresses. I'll see you all on the mailing lists. Questions? So go back, could you go back two slides for me? If you have a backward, okay, so the OVS TCP undump, can you, you can actually take the byte stream from that and pass it to the command, I think in two or three slides previous, Yep. and it'll show you, in addition, because in that particular example, you had a really nice pretty print, like import this version, type, type ICMP, I think it, sh it should. This, this guy, yeah. So, so you can just pass it a raw stream? Yes, you can You can pass the stream of bytes. I forget the exact syntax, but it, but it does actually take it. Um, that's cool, that's really cool. Yeah, so I could have tried to cook up the XRGs pipeline to, to make it happen, but I'm not that cool. Yeah, just a simple question on the logging thing. Do, on systemd systems, do you log to the journal by default? I'm sorry, um, what was that? On systemd systems, do you log to the journal, like as well as or instead of the log file? Yeah. Because that's so, kind of where I look for logs. Yeah, so uh, it's true right now we we aren't logging to the systemd journal. Um, that's probably a good enhancement to make because I think a lot of tools do make use of that journal now. So, yeah, propose it on the mailing list, maybe. So you had... Um, You said that uh, when when a packet comes down or up upflow, the up and, call, yep. yeah, up call, and then the uh, as a result of that forwarding, the uh, uh, there's a update on the uh, on the flow database. Pattern. Yeah. Yes. So is that the is that is that from the get go or there is a configuration for all the uh, for the forwarding done ahead of time? Is it always learned, or is it? Is it yeah, it's, it's always learned. So if you go back, um, if I go back to this post here. So see this um, this blog uh, post, if you actually go there, so um, that talks about programming the kernel, da kernel um, like the, the open V switch module in kernel. It does not contain flows by default. So by default, a packet comes in uh, and it doesn't match anything, and then it's pushed to a, you know, it's pushed to an up call, pushed to an up call, so, and processed. And then that table is updated. I think I'm out of time. I don't think this. No, good talk. Thanks. So to answer your question, what uh, Aaron mentioned, I think he uh, was rushing towards the slides. So on the high level, there is. A, I'm going to do a shameless plug. There are two other utilities: plotnet config, which gives a static X-ray of the system within the server, and another project called Skydive. That is exactly what Aaron mentioned, but I just wanted to mention again. So those. Correct. Yep, you can get a map. We can talk offline also. But there are other utilities above and beyond this. This was at a lower level, but there are higher level maps, sort of network operating system, all of that stuff available. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yep. In addition. Yep. Okay. Thank you, Aaron. Um, 
I just wanted to highlight uh, that there will be a party tonight at 7 p.m. at the Skin Lounge. So please do collect your tickets at the registration desk if you haven't already. And if in case you don't want to attend and you change your mind, please do give it back to us because we just have 200 uh, seats for that. So, but we do hope to see you all there. Thank you. So what's the protocol on changing out laptops? Okay, uh, this is not yours, so we can like... Perfect. And is there any DP or is it only uh, HDMI? There's HDMI and there is VG. Okay. What do you have? I have a mini display port, but I also have HDMI. So. Okay, awesome. Okay, I didn't have to run around there. Okay, here we go. Thank you. Since I've got like two minutes. Yeah, no worries. Uh, so and then is there a dongle for. Uh, yes. Sorry. It's okay. What is it? Uh, OpenShift for operators. Thomas Cameron. Thomas Cameron, yes. right here. Oh, yeah. Good. How are you doing? Good. Check, check. Yeah, Check, check, mic check. 